Hello, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all at AI Meetup number three, hosted by Artificial Intelligence Association of Lithuania. I'm so happy to see the full audience of AI enthusiasts, both beginners and professionals, and I'm sure that we are going to have a great evening tonight. So for those who don't know us yet, uh, like I mentioned, we're called Artificial Intelligence Association of Lithuania. It's not the same uh, artificial intelligence group like before. We are now more institutionalized. We now have more institutionalized form. In Lithuanian, we are called Lietuvos Dirbtinio Intellecto Asociacija. So please don't be confused if you see those two names uh, somewhere separately. That's the same organization. And uh, I would like to begin uh, our evening by saying what defines us, because many of you are still asking uh, how are you different from other associations, from other organizations. So this meetup is a great example what, what it what it really means to be or to be this organization. So first of all, it's a nonprofit model. Like you notice, you didn't have to pay a cent for to come here. Secondly, like I can completely see it's a great community of AI professionals and enthusiasts. Thirdly, it's a great opportunity for professionals to share knowledge and for those interested to gather many new, much new information. And finally, we hope that you will enjoy our quality-oriented events and this meetup will also be a great example of it. Also, you're asking often how to join and how to become a part of Artificial Intelligence Association. So, uh, we welcome both uh, both physical persons, natural persons, and uh, organizations. So you can see here membership fees and uh, Google Forms can be found both on Slack and uh, Facebook channels. So we have a public group and both on Facebook and Slack. So you are all welcome to join the discussions, to share anything you find interesting about artificial intelligence, and of course, if if you want to join the association. Uh, how to learn more about us. So uh, I would like to present Audrey Zuis, who is probably the main person of the association, and without him, uh, I wouldn't even be here. So he was joking that this is the first time when he's sitting somewhere in the audience. I don't see you at the moment, but hello there, Audrey. <laughs> he's the president of the association and CTO at Argyle. Here's this email where you can send him a couple of words just to say hi or, or express your wish to join the association, hopefully. Uh, this is me. Well, she looks like me, apparently. I'm the meetup co-organizer and PhD student at Vilnius University Law Faculty. I consider myself more like AI enthusiast, definitely far from being a professional, but uh, I'm happy that I work uh, on a dissertation related to, to emerging technologies and human rights, so that's how I'm related to artificial intelligence. And finally, the third contact person uh, that you're all welcome to chat up during the networking session uh, is David Smatachunas, who welcomed you all and registered you all, so thank you very much for that. He is also a Meetup co-organizer together with me and Odros, and data scientist at IBM. Now, the most exciting part. The first part of our evening is going to be about impressions from the so-called largest AI conference of 2019, your IPS. Uh, I don't know how the speakers came up with, with that name. Well, I, I've noticed there's a discussion somewhere about to create some interesting names, how to survive the biggest conference, somewhere about to say, no, 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 let's stick to the sim simple version, just impressions. But I'm sure that the variety of speakers will, will explain everything to you all. This conference um, is about neural information processing systems. And just to say a couple of words about the importance of it is that the conference comprised last year more than 1,000 of papers and about 14,000 of attendees in that conference. And luckily, we have three of them this evening. The first one is Manta Spuida, who is responsible for machine learning at Unity Labs. Where are your applause? <laughs> uh, those who are all on the Slack, on the Slack channel probably noticed the, the witty photo that Mantas uses. It's a grumpy cat with David Booby, so now you can see his real face, which is not grumpy at all. Yep. <laughs> 
Now, the second speaker, who is also be going to presenting his impressions from the conference, is Ronaldo Zoma, who is a shepherd at Unity. I was always wondering what shepherd means, but probably the speaker will explain everything to you as well. So, welcome Ronaldo as well. He's sitting over here. And the third speaker is Jonas Kubilos, who is a co-founder of Three Thirds. Again, the, the title of the company is very interesting because I was thinking, why not to simplify that equation and just to say a one, one company? Well, well, Jonas is from that one company of Three Thirds, and he's going to present his impressions too. So now, oh, that, you, don't, you didn't have to see that yet. But now I'm giving the floor to Mantas and Hopefully, we'll hear some interesting talks. What? Good evening. Uh, I, I will be presenting the easiest part, uh, how the conference works and how do you feel that conference and experience from the humankind perspective. And Ronaldo then will look more from the hardware side, and uh, Jonas will talk more about the scientific scientific side of it. Yeah, and that's basically it. So why, when I was telling to my friends that I'm going to Canada in December, I got a lot of odd looks. Why? Right? And yeah, I was also doing some research. And turns out that Vancouver is pretty nice city. This doesn't work. <laughs> Too far. Yeah, so basically this is venue where the conference was happening. Actually half of it. And there is nice view over out of the bay. And yeah, basically the conference structure is quite simple and also quite confusing because well, you expect that some words mean something in usual case, but in conference it means something else. Uh, so it has industry expo, which is not so much industry as this mix of recruiting and HR section and also showing some real hardware. I don't know how these two mix together well. And the keynotes, they have not one, but actually like four or something every day different keynote, uh, sometimes twice per day. Also, they have tutorials, which are not the same as you can see in usual software uh, tutorials. I, I mean, they don't tell step by step what to do. Tutorials means that it's introduction section into a new field or new area. If you are like, coming and don't know anything about robotics, you might go to the robotics tutorial and they will tell you all the key papers from that area from the very beginning of the robotics industry now up till current days. And the workshops also are not like coding workshops. It's more like most cutting edge papers being discussed now in front of you and then later you can ask questions, people presenting them. Also, they have the poster sessions where all the papers are printed on the big sheets of paper and are shown to you to read and discuss with the authors. And also have a lot of informal meetups. For example, we had Lithuanians and Latvians, Estonians dinner at the conference. I think there was about 10 Lithuanians there. Yeah, now about the numbers. And you can see that AI is exploding and the conference is exploding. So the blue bar is how many papers, the submissions they receive, and the gray bar is how many they accept. It's roughly 21%, but still accepted papers is like 1,428. You can imagine how much time it would take for you to read them all. And the amount of people coming to the conference is also exploding. Now it was 14,000. And they actually had to organize lottery. If you like, want to pay about $1,000 for the ticket of the conference, 
you still need to apply for lottery. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, right? I, I would estimate that about half of people only got the tickets. So the demand was about 30,000 people wanting to go to the same conference. And yeah, if you are deep mind Google, you have the best chances to be accepted as the speaker and uh, to have paper in the conference. Next big thing is MIT. Yeah, so DeepMind is doing a lot of uh, reality distortion. If you see the poster from DeepMind, usually there's like 30 or 50 people around it and trying to understand what it's doing. And sometimes the paper is just average. Yeah, that's how, how you experience 14,000 people in single place. And people were tweeting about it. Is it a like, Rolling Stones concert? And this is how it looks in video. People are coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. And this is poster session. <laughs> Basically, at the same spot, they are showing 200 papers. And they're showing them for four hours. And then doing next round, another four hours after midday. And so for five days. That's how you present 1,500 papers per conference. So yeah, after conference, there were kind of discussions is it getting too big? And yeah, it's, it's definitely stretching the boundaries, what is the academic conference. But in my personal experience, it was very well organized. And actually, you, could, you survived so many people. In, it was quite, quite easy to survive that many people. For example, Google I.O. or Apple WWDC tech conferences uh, bring twice less people, and they are more complicated to do. Uh, survive because you always have to wait in the queues until you get into a room and or until you can get to talk to engineers etc so it was really well organized so does it make sense to go there sometimes yes sometimes not if you just want to watch video or read the papers do it online here are the links if you if you have some time but if you want to experience it more deeply, you have to network, network, network. And you also can get a personal explanations on the papers and, and presentations from the offers. I think it's a great thing. You also can touch real hardware or you might find a job. Yeah, so a couple of my favorite workshops. It was AI artist workshop. Now you can see why it was quite interesting to me and uh, AI competition workshops. Basically, all the, uh, some of the competitions are running in Kaggle, and they have prize coming to the NeurIPS conference to present your winning solution at the conference. Yeah. Uh, so for artist workshops, it's kind of, you can see a lot of interest from artist people trying AI, but in my experience, it's still not yet there. But there is a lot of interest, both for music, visual arts, etc. So for quick overview of AI competitions, uh, I was looking at Lyft, 3D object detection for self-driving cars, Ducky Town, self-driving competition, robotics, uh, hand controlling competition, animal AI Olympics, Pomerman. Here you see this Ducky Town, they have very nice setup for standardized platform, which is this hardware. It has RGB camera, some sensors, and it has to go the street around. Sometimes it just turns around and goes different, uh, opposite direction than it, it was asked for, and it looks funny. And it's a very good project if you want to introduce students to the self-driving problems. And then you can experience how hard it is to get it right. And uh, yeah, some key takeaways from these AI competitions that if you host AI competition in your blog post or some well, not well-known problem, usually you get seven submissions. None of them are good. 
and you can't even award them because they don't provide any reasonable solution. And also, winners tend to be serial winners. And uh, if you was a winner at the past competition, which was, which was in a similar field, usually you have better chances winning next one. So it's very good advice to look at the similar competitions in the past and see which uh, solutions we are winning at that time. Also, sadly, but Kaggle competition solutions usually underperform compared to the com uh, commercial ones. Because people working for money usually do it eight hours per day for months and months and months and pro produce best resolutions. But it's still a good tool for doing hiring or getting people interested in the field. It's like basically PR. And uh, for many strategic games, uh, planning algorithms are usually better than neural nets, which is kind of obvious, but also at the same time not. And sometimes picking not so well thought uh, evaluation procedure for picking winning solutions might ruin whole your competition. Here is an example of robotic hand the competition. Basically, the task was you have three objects. One of them is misplaced. And uh, the task is to place that third object somewhere either, either there somewhere or the next level. It's like two and a half D problem. The winning solution was where, uh, the one which was doing nothing. <laughs> well, if you have three objects, right? Two of them are already in the right place. So if you don't do anything, you have two thirds of the good solution. And depending on the loss or, or like error function which they picked, it's pretty good solution, right? So they had, had sadly recognized that nobody won that competition. Yeah, that's basically all from me. Okay. So the most you, you probably can extract from the from the conference is be going to the posters. And uh, that's pretty hardcore, and you can learn a lot by talking to, to authors. You can pretty much ask them a, a, anything, and they can explain it to you. So that's the best way to, to learn, actually, during the conference, go to the posters. However, uh, that's two hours of posters, and usually your head explodes afterwards. And uh, then you can go and relax at the expo. And uh, the expo is another quite interesting part. It's called Industry Expo. But in this year, uh, the expo was mostly about the hardware, uh, at least for me, it struck mostly about the hardware, about the AI chips. Not this type of hardware, but uh, this type of uh, hardware. It's actually this year, the first time when I saw massive uh, appearance of real, actual new chips dedicated to AI uh, from the startups, uh, from the companies, before they were only presenting ideas or they were presenting their prototypes. And this year, it was actual real hardware from multiple companies that can be already used. So I will cover it a little bit. So pretty much uh, there were a number of, some of them quite well-known companies. Uh, some of them w uh, raised quite a lot of money for, for, the, for the hardware. Uh, and uh, um, Intel bought Nirvana a couple of years, three years ago. Uh, it, it's a, it was a startup that was dedicated for developing a chips dedicated to AI. As you probably know, nowadays most of the AI is, are running on the GPUs, which are graphics processing units, which were not originally created for AI, but by the virtue of being a very parallelizable and very uh, fast uh, specialized hardware for graphics, Due to certain reasons, it became the, 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 the most kind of common use now is to run AI on those cards. But people kind of trying to create a new hardware more dedicated specific for the AI. And in, Nirvana was one of the first companies starting doing that. Intel bought them, and this year we, you, could, uh, you could see and check the already existing hardware. The one is for training, which looks in the form factor of, it pretty much looks like a GPU, uh, like a desktop GPU, but it is, uh, 
uh, at, because of the price, it's mostly dedicated to servers. Now, they showed another uh, special hardware which is dedicated to inference. Inference is something like a running network, not training, but just running. And you can see there's a, like a blades. They are very thin. Uh, the chips are inside of this kind of thin blade. And the server itself, it hosts a lot of like a stack of, of those blades. Basically, every line here is a blade. Uh, and they can, they can put a lot of them. And main thing that one of the main things that they are solving actually is, is the density, that they can put a lot more computational kind of chips in the same space. It's kind of mostly mm, important for the servers, but it's interesting kind of problem that they are solving, uh, the density. Habana is another company uh, that was presenting their, showing their real actual hardware, both for the one hardware Goya, Goya for the uh, training and a different Gaudi for inference. And you can see here how, as well, how the machine itself looks. It's as well, they can put, they are not just manufacturing one card, but they are building the kind of the infrastructure for the, for the racks that you can put a lot of those chips uh, on the same motherboard uh, as well to increase the number, like the density of the computational power uh, per square kind of centimeter. Uh, and immediately after the conference or during the conference, it, uh, they, they got acquired, oh, there, there was a press release that Intel acquired Habana. So by now Intel acquired at least three big companies, Movideos, Nirvana and Habana. Uh, so yeah, they are trying to kind of compensate on the fact that GPUs are taking their share, uh, so in, instead of kind of developing their own hardware, Intel is just going buying uh, potential startups or potential the companies that already developed something. The Graph Core is another uh, another develop, uh, another kind of company that is developing as well uh, chip uh, devices for the for the training. So it's as well comes in the form factor of something like looks a little bit like a GPU. It, you can slot it into the normal uh, PCI slots. Uh, it's pretty fat. It has a lot of cooling on the side. Uh, the problem they are kind of trying to solve is uh, the, those basically it's a runs from the graph core running like training on a ResNet and the yellow is pretty much where the devices are communicating so they are, they are running a lot of chips at the same time and the, the yellow bars is when those chips are kind of communicating between each other. So with the, G, with the normal GPU that would still mean that the, the chip would still be running at the same time. What they do instead they shut it kind of down at the same at, at that moment during the like a waiting or during the exchange of data, the chip goes to a shutdown mode. It's just a couple of milliseconds, but it allows them to save power. Uh, so basically, their hardware is dedicated to reducing the power consumption. It's not that, that much faster than GPU, but it saves power uh, by shutting down itself quite often. Another quite very interesting uh, development is the Cerebras company which produce chips on the size of the wafer. So with the wafer, it's, it's like an A4, A4 piece of paper. Like this, is, is, this is their chip here. And this is a normal chip. You can see like it's kind of normal chip is quite smaller. So when the wafer is something when you produce the chips, it's, it comes on those kind of big, big round piece. Uh, and usually what, when you produce a chips, you kind of, you have to cut them and every piece of it becomes its own chip. But Cerebras is taking advantage of this process and creating the full chip that covers the full wafer, the huge, humongous chip. And the machine to run it is as well, quite humongous. It's powered by, you have to basically, this, like you can see, that's a huge box here. Uh, probably 80% of it is actually water cooling. The actual computer is this part here, and the chip is sitting here, like slotted in. And most of it is, these are very high, high bandwidth net, mm, network connections, so like you can feed enough data into this machine, and uh, the rest is water cooling and energy supply to it. As well, uh, they are trying, basically, uh, the idea is, all of that is 
pretty much dedicated to server. So if you're expecting from that hardware to be in your desktop machine, no, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So all of these developments, they are right now concentrating on the servers. And are they really faster than GPU? From what I've saw, what I've talked with these people, it does not seem to be much faster than GPU. However, it can have much den more density per like a square meter of, power, of computational power, and it can eat significantly less energy. So for most use cases, it doesn't really matter unless you're building the cloud. So if you're building the cloud, you probably should start in getting more into uh, what that hardware is and how to operate it. For most of us, otherwise, we're probably going to use that hardware just through, like we usually do through, through the cloud, without really uh, taking any changes, maybe even to the models. So there's a couple of future hardware trends which were discussed. There's a couple of workshops and was one keynote that was discussing the actual hardware uh, for the future. And probably the kind of the most interesting concept is as well only to people that who are actually working really close to the hardware. Uh, I would just mention it. It's bringing compute closer into the memory, like basically having memory chip, sit, the compute will be sitting inside of the memory chip at some point. And analog computation is another kind of opportunity that people are currently uh, investigating. Uh, so basically, instead of doing, the, instead of multiplying and adding with the, uh, with the high precision, instead the machine can do just uh, sum up the voltage. Uh, the problem is uh, it has a high noise uh, profile. So it's a battle of the noise versus precision. There's some funny things as well. <laughs> so uh, I was presenting the dog and it reacts. Okay, uh, so there's one very interesting initiative that is happening during the NeurIPS Neur conference is Women in ML. And uh, it's that's the real kind of statistics right now. There is not that many women working in academia, working in machine learning, and the initiative is trying to promote, find more, uh, kind of make it more interesting, more approachable, and promote in general uh, machine learning to, uh, to to women. And NeurIPS is 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 doing comparatively well. I've been to the NeurIPS first time three years ago, and this year quite more, more women, more papers coming from, uh, from, from women. And uh, the interesting thing is not, it's not sponsored by some politicians or by some, no, it's actually sponsored, all these initiatives, they are sponsored by the industry itself. Uh, Unity, for instance, it's our company, we are one of the gold sponsors for it. We are, uh, like, the many companies understand the actual necessity of uh, having more women in, uh, in, in the community because it brings more ideas, different ideas. So, so yeah, it's some geeks play event. So these geeks actually post papers and then they, if you hear the music, they're quite good at it. There's even more geeks in the background. So that's, that's the end of the conference. That's how they're ending the conference. this type of Or should I at least go and play it? Okay. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, all right, so for the last part of uh, this presentation, I'm gonna talk about my impressions on the scientific part of the conference. Um, so this was my third uh, NURBS where I had a paper uh, accepted and the second one where I was actually physically present and the first one for which I reviewed. Um, so that is to say that I'm not quite new to this conference anymore. But this year was very special to me because we also had our paper accepted for an oral presentation. Um, so if you remember Mantas mentioning how there were uh, around 14, uh, for, um, uh, 1,400 papers accepted. Now, to get an oral presentation, that's uh, 40 papers out of those uh, 1,400. 
So it was really nice to, to, to have that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, and so, so I'm gonna show my, uh, a, a couple of things about the paper I had. Um, so this paper was, uh, uh, because I think it also uh, shows some of the trends uh, at NeurIPS. Now, NeurIPS is called Neural Information Processing Systems, uh, but the N part, the neural part, has never been represented there, and it was not represented this year either. Uh, so our paper was one of the few papers that was actually describing something that had neuroscience in it. Um, and, um, and the reason I think this is very relevant, well, on the one hand, the, the message that we were bringing forward was that um, if, you're, if you're interested in building models off the brain, then perhaps you should follow best practices in machine learning, which is have a benchmark, and then if you have a benchmark, then build a model that beats that benchmark. Now, this is sadly not the, real, uh, uh, the, the reality of neuroscience, uh, so that's the message we were bringing forward, and we built uh, and, and so we uh, composed uh, the largest benchmark to date that has neural and behavioral data from humans and, and non-human primates. Um, and so you have those measures and then, uh, then you could benchmark your, the existing available uh, neural networks on this benchmark, which is what we did and we found very nice trends that these networks are able to predict neural and behavioral responses in, 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 in humans really well. But then we went on and showed that you don't have to stop there. You can actually build a better model than that. Um, and um, that was our contribution. Now, <clears throat> now, the interesting thing for me was that I only realized after the conference was that a lot of people uh, saw this as a neuroscience um, um, talk and therefore they kind of weren't that interested to begin with because most people that come to NeurIPS are in machine learning. Uh, researchers, but but then you would hear those same people at their presentations talking about uh, bringing forward the following message: uh, current models that we are using in machine learning work like this and that, but this is not how the brain works, and the brain works like this. And then they go on and describe how the brain works, which is you know like if you don't do neuroscience and then you try to explain how the brain works. Is, is a little bit outdated, like about 100 years old outdated. When people used to do intuitive theories and kind of introspection thinking about like, well, how would things work? So there is a big missing opportunity in my view where, um, where machine learning researchers could communicate the things that they would like to, to know from neuroscience and then neuroscientists could actually help them to find answers, but neither are doing this. So I was hope, I, I kind of see our contribution as helping to start the discussion. Um, now, that was, uh, this work came from uh, my uh, postdoctoral years at MIT and University of Leuven in Belgium. But now, as, as Aurelia mentioned, I'm already uh, out of academia doing my own uh, startup, which nobody knows about, so that, that is called Three Thirds. And to answer your question, why not simplify three-thirds? Well, first of all, I also don't quite like the, the name, which I came up with. But second of all, well, if you simplify three-thirds, then it would become unity. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, uh, so nonetheless, we are focusing, uh, just because I have the time, I can tell you what we do. So we're focusing on two things. W one thing we're doing is, is AI consultancy, so uh, finding, uh, helping people bring, well, large companies build AI solutions. Uh, and we're also uh, doing uh, basic AI research where we focus on uh, developing better, uh, more robust, um, uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, algorithms. And I'm mentioning that because that was driving my most, most of my interest during the, the conference which is what I'm gonna describe next. So there, um, so uh, mostly what I was interested in was the two workshops, uh, well, uh, the meta learning workshop and deep uh, reinforcement learning workshop, which I think are defining more or less the, the future of, you know, of the interesting things to do. So the less interest, well, to, to put it nicely, is, is like mostly 
to, to date, uh, a lot of research has been focused on developing, uh, on bringing understanding how sensory modalities could be implemented in, in the brain, like uh, in, in machines, like uh, for instance, how visual processing might work so that you could recognize objects in an image or uh, perhaps even language processing, how you could categorize something about the, the, the text. Um, this is something that um, um, is called System 1 Deep Learning, uh, which is the term that I first heard uh, at the keynote at NURPS from, uh, from Joshua Bengio. So, and I, I thought that that, that uh, keynote was encapsulating mostly like what is the state of, of the art today in, in neuroscience and where we're going. So he was describing how the System 1, the sensory processing, is, um, is very automatic, very, uh, um, well, fast, uh, um, and it works really well for specific applications. Um, like if you have a very specific task, you have specific data set, then uh, these models are able to capture these, uh, these data very well. Uh, but, um, uh, but there's a lot of missing in that. And before I describe that, actually, I remember that one impression I had at NeurIPS also was that um, a lot of the work about on system one processing has been, has moved from sort of basic research into applications area. So there were a lot of uh, things, uh, were, uh, a lot of posters about just applying stuff to a new domain. Um, so uh, the, the trend I, I would say, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm right, that the trend is to move towards systems that would be uh, not so domain specific. So typically when you train a model, it would be able to solve a task uh, for, uh, for data that comes from a particular distribution. But if you want it to generalize outside of that distribution, then you're in a big trouble. So I'm showing some of, uh -huh. so there's a generalization sample efficiency and meta RL uh, arrow up there, uh, which, is, um, which is one of the problems that a lot of people identify as, as, as a problem and I'm, I'm sort of, listing here uh, things that, um, that th these, these were the, the things that people talked a, a lot about and uh, Peter Abiel was probably one of the most um, interesting people uh, describing this fact that, or, or trying to propose solutions how you could uh, go about uh, building more robust models or more sample efficient, so models that could learn from less data. And, and, and one popular solution that has been around for a few years but I haven't been using these techniques is called meta-RL, where instead of training for one task, you train on multiple tasks, and then you ask the model, and then the model is hopefully able to work on all of them after training is done. So that's called meta-learning, uh, meta and in reinforcement learning, it would be meta-reinforcement learning. Now I realize that maybe not everybody is, knows what reinforcement learning is, so basically you're trying to learn how to complete a task by performing a bunch of um, actions. In, uh, so like maybe trying to win a game when, uh, w uh, when uh, like Go or, or StarCraft, both of which are actually now uh, mostly outperformed by machines. So um, StarCraft was actually presented at NeurIPS this year as well uh, and, uh, and they were showing how they can win against professional players. Um, so that, um, okay, so that generalization was one trend, the other was very closely related continual learning. So if you want to learn, um, uh, if you want to learn, keep learning, not, not just like learn for once and then stop, but keep learning, then you need to think about how a network might remember things um, and not forget. So usually what happens, like you train on something, then you keep training and then it forgets what it learned uh, last time. And that, that's called catastrophic forgetting. So that's not very good. Uh, so people are thinking of, so we're proposing solutions to that. I named Jeff Clunas as, you know, with the animal technique that I found, found very interesting. Uh, and closely related curriculum learning, right here where you, instead of learning everything at the same time, maybe you structure your learning a little bit. Uh, starting with something simple and then making it a bit more complicated. So the poet was showing how, uh, poet technique is showing how to automate the choice of how to establish this curriculum. Now, the other, the last two trends I want to briefly mention was exploration. So now when you have a, 
say you have a, a reinforcement learning agent that is um, navigating in the space and, and trying to solve a task, there's a problem uh, usually that they, they, they don't really know how to explore the environment very well. So if you throw them into a new environment, uh, they don't really know how to find the goal. And uh, especially if, if the goal, the, if, if some reward doesn't happen very often. So if you're dropped into a big maze and then uh, the, there is a goal at the very end of it, it takes a lot of patience to get to that goal and agents don't have that much patience. So you need uh, really to think how to explore the environments efficiently or explore at all. Um, so I think that is a very interesting trend and, and that's something that we're also exploring in our startup. And the last trend is, is a model free versus model uh, together with model based RL. So model free reinforcement learning is something that people have been using uh, all the time now uh, to win all these games like StarCraft and Go and uh, Atari and Dota 2 and so on. Uh, so you just throw in this agent that is learning in the environment and you don't have any assumptions how the environment works. It just works from getting feedback and like if it loses then it knows that next time I should do some a different action, a sequence of actions. Uh, it takes a lot of time to, learn, uh, to train these models and they're very not robust but you can do it. Um, but people are not happy anymore because they, they kind of want to have this generalization um, uh, to new environments or new tasks. And therefore, they're trying to marry that with model-based reinforcement learning where you now are trying to build a model of the environment. You try to figure out actively how it works and, and have explicit predictions about uh, its, uh, uh, well, its physics, let's say, or, or like the, the way, yeah, the, the way what's gonna happen if I'm gonna make this step or what if, what's gonna happen if I'm gonna make that action. Uh, so there were quite a few uh, interesting papers presented in marrying the two, uh, the two fields. And then overall, the, the, the whole thing was, as I said, mentioned, um, captured by Joshua Bengio's talk where he was describing system two. So all of these features come from system two deep learning where where we are talking about some sort of cognitive abilities, like ability to plan, ability to reason, ability perhaps to deal in a bit more symbolic space. If you're able to, to abstract out what you're seeing, then perhaps uh, you would be a bit more robust next time the, uh, when you're trying to do a task. Uh, and in particular, what I found very interesting was his uh, 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 attempt to, to marry them in the following way. He would be saying like, well, System one is giving us some, you know, some sem sensory input, some grounding to the reality. But then we, kind of, we probably, what we really want to do with those massive inputs that we get from sensory inputs, so, so like from, from vision, let's say we get a lot of information, we want to attend to specific parts of our, of our, uh, of our inputs uh, such that our representations higher up would be more sparse, more, um, uh, perhaps more abstract. And, um, and critically, perhaps we want to figure out what the relations are between different agents in the environment or, or, or be between like if I do some action, what is it, how does it relate to the rest of the world? And mostly what happens is that if I do something, if, if, if I drop the mic, let's say, um, the, well, the, uh, the, the cars won't stop on the streets, right? So things are typically very disconnected and there's only a very few things that are connected. So the purpose would be, uh, I guess, for these systems to work, to have, to figure out these, the, the very sparse graph of causal relations between like, if I do X, what, thing, what are the things that are gonna be um, affected? And if you have that, then he hopes that, that that is enough perhaps for us to be able to operate in a, in a bit more robust and uh, uh, symbolic way. Um, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much for all the speakers for indeed very interesting and diverse talk. Now we have some time for any questions that you might have. We have a couple of mics. So who is willing to volunteer first? Are there any questions that came up to your mind? Well, I have the first one, quite, quite funny one to Ronaldo. You were showing about, about some concert going on. 
was there some AI music playing or were there real players? Uh, yeah. I would expect some AI music, you know, in that conference. So, uh, no AI music at that, uh, at that point, uh, but there was uh, a, um, artist workshops be before that where people actually were presenting some AI generated music. Uh, unfortunately, it is not yet as good, so you would enjoy it at the end of the conference. Mm -hmm. But it's very promising. It's more of a like a tools that can help you to create music, but you still need a human. Did you hear any interesting examples? No. Not really. <laughs> Not really. Mantas, maybe you, you. No. No. It's it. Uh, I, I've heard interesting examples, but outside of the conference. But uh, it's it's more of a uh, yeah. It's uh, actually yesterday. The, 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 the it's an online tool where you can, uh, I forgot the name, uh, how it's called actually, but it is an online tool where you can go and you can say what type of music you want to produce, uh, make, uh, what type of instruments, and it will create some form of like a MIDI file basically for you that you can uh, download and play with it afterwards. It kind of generates your ideas, composition. Yeah, it creates a composition for the, of the music. That's, that's indeed some food for thought. Maybe anybody else wants to feed their curiosity? Like I mentioned, any, any type of questions are welcome. We had both do's and don'ts and scientific talks, so yes, please. Uh, so from the research paper perspective, does, um, does the average time to train the model increasing or decreasing or staying the same? Who would like to answer? Um, I, I think often it's not reported how long it took, um, but you could definitely see that a lot of winning solutions would, would uh, require large servers to train. Um, so I, I think, you know, if you want to compete nowadays, you certainly need like a huge compute power and it would be hard to prove that your result is better than somebody else's uh, without doing that. So if you don't have a server, then you, you, have, <laughs> you have poor chances of, uh, of, provi of, of proving that your solution is better than others. I would like to add that uh, for uh, Lyft uh, self-driving AI competition, the winning uh, team was using 17 GPUs, the second place was using seven GPUs, and third place was using four GPUs. So there is some correlation, but uh, I, I think on over, overall in this um, academic circles, overusing just raw like computing power is kind of seen as really dumb solution in many cases. Basically, why you don't innovate on better presentation of the data or better architecture, why you just throwing more GPUs at the problem? There is definitely a call to, to, to look at the simpler models. Like some people, although probably the, the dominant idea is that people throw a lot of compute power, but there is people started talking more and more about like, hey, we have to invest, invest into uh, for instance, if you want to research something, maybe the research activation functions, just that. Uh, there, is a there is a bunch of like a small things that can be, uh, can uncover quite a lot of power and people are realizing that, yeah, it's, it's actually important to work on those issues as well. There's one more question. Yeah. So is everyone talking about train training or is, are people talking about inference now as well? What's the distribution, I guess, between, you know, everyone's curious about accuracy and, and training, but what are the differences? All right. Uh, I mean, uh, we with Mantas actually quite, we're working on an inference problem, so for us it's quite interesting, but I would say even, I wouldn't, I mean, it's an academic conference where people mostly talk about uh, less practical things, I would say, right? More of a research thing, is, and the, the, the inference was not a big topic. I would say uh, I would rarely find. I mean, there's a special workshops on the hardware where people go and discuss a little bit about that, but it's like a, a, a fraction of the of the conference. It's uh, it's uh, I don't know, maybe hundred people talking about that, and maybe twenty uh, papers. Uh, discussing that. 
what as well they were discussing a lot about the need for metrics, being able to compare different models as well in terms of the efficiency. Because you can sometimes one paper says, okay, we run this, so it's training on that time, but the batch size is like that. Avra says, okay, we're training, this is our time, but the batch size is different, hardware is different. How do you come, like uh, the companies are saying, well, our new hardware has this amount of peak performance. Uh, and Ava says, oh, but our peak performance is even higher, but actually the, your model needs to be like four times bigger. So basically, how do we compare all these models? How as a researcher or as a developer, uh, if you do the inference model, how do you optimize inference? How do you actually figure out which hardware to use, how to, how to compare them, and how to compare algorithms? But it's more of an open question of how do we figure out those metrics? Are there any more questions, maybe from the back of the audience, or maybe even Odr Zuzi himself, who promised to have a lot of questions, but unfortunately I don't see him here. <laughs> I don't see him here anymore, that's sad. Well, because we are free, we can ask each other for quite a, a long time. Or if you are too shy to ask questions in front of all the people, then I'm... I'm saying that's, that, that's high time for food and drinks sponsored by Oxypit and uh, please enjoy the break, do lots of networking and big, great, big round of applause to all the speakers. And just one last note, please do come after the break as we're going to hear a talk of co-founder of Oxypit. Enjoy the break. Ja, das ist ein bisschen 
Aš noriu pašniekėti, sveiki. Tai telefonai.
we start in the 10 minutes for second talk. Gledam. Ajde.
Uh, we start in the three minutes, so... Okay, so I think we can start some of the... Okay, so first of all, I want to thank from all the organization to Occiput for sponsoring us with food and drinks. And our second uh, speaker is Darius Borshauskas, co-founder and data scientist at Occiput, also uh, Kaggle Grandmaster. And today, Darius talk about how to build and deploy AI system in healthcare. So, Darius, if you are ready, just start. Hello. Testing, testing. Okay. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to, to be in this uh, meetup. Uh, uh, today I'm going to be, I'm, I'll be talking about uh, things what uh, we have done in Occiput and how we built our company, uh, the things that we did and what, what, I, what I would like, to, would have, uh, what I wanted to know before I started the, uh, our uh, startup. So there is maybe some idea, maybe some people here considering starting their own startup. So. I hope this will be interesting for you uh, the most, but uh, I think it will be uh, as interesting for everyone as well. Um, so, uh, uh, in brief, I'm, well, uh, uh, Kaggle Grandmaster, so what does that mean? So, Kaggle is a platform for data scientists to compete against each other and try to build uh, the best uh, solutions for um, open data projects. So. Uh, in that sense, it's the largest platform, and it has its own ranking. Uh, so, uh, last year I was like four, fourth overall. So it's like from a million users in the platform, and fourth place I, I, is very good achievement. And, <laughs> and uh, I'm kind, I'm very happy with it. But the, in the last year, I'm not participating that much because, well, the startup uh, requires lots of time and dedication, so uh, this is uh, pretty much uh, past for me. Uh, and currently I, I'm uh, working in, at Occiput as a data scientist, so I'm responsible for building models, uh, deploying them into, into production, and doing all the monitoring and, and, and such. So. Um, what we uh, do in Occiput is 
building this type of, uh, let's say, plugin for doctors uh, who specialize in the field of radiology. So radiologists uh, are these kind of doctors who do not interact with patients, but they only look at images and try to describe what they see. So uh, whether uh, the patient is healthy uh, or not, and what kind of uh, pathology the patient has. So typically, the doc this, doc uh, this doctor has two monitors uh, side by side, and one side he has a work list of patients who are uh, requiring uh, attention, and on the uh, right side, you, typically they have an image viewer uh, where they see the image. So at Occiput, we, are, we specialize in chest x-rays. So why chest x-rays? Because well, it is the most common procedure in any hospital in the world. Uh, there are over two billion x-rays, chest x-rays, done uh, uh, around the world in a year. And we thought that this task is, uh, that this task can be automated at some level, and, and this is what we try to achieve. So in, this, in these pictures, we can actually see the, the product uh, in the, uh, a radiologist workstation. So on the left, we have a, a report, a radiology report. So this report is generated by our software. So if, if the task for a radiologist is to write the report, he can already see the report generated by our, our software. And if he likes the report, he can already approve that uh, and spend less time uh, like writing the, the text uh, by himself. And if something is, uh, let's say, our software makes an error, you can actually visualize by, by which area the, the error wa uh, was made. So uh, in this sense, it's uh, kind of useful. And uh, we have uh, several deployments where doctors are uh, already using that. So how does this all look like uh, in, in the background? So we have the hospital has two two types of uh, vendors. So one is providing hardware and other is providing software. So for the hardware, uh, also which comes with software, uh, is, is usually um, data storage, uh, which is a very, very big issue uh, in hospitals because, well, uh, a, sing a single image, let's say chest x-ray, can take up uh, uh, about 30 megabytes. And if you're like a uh, high volume hospital, it's, it's, it's it, it add, add as adds up to terabytes in a pretty short time. And on the other hand, we have hospital information systems where the, there is a patient data or the doctor work list. And uh, we as a company have to deal with both of these types of vendors. So both uh, have, have to have knowledge how to retrieve data from, uh, from uh, data storage uh, devices and how to transfer the data to the uh, workstation of the doctor. Uh, this involves lots of technical stuff like uh, knowing how to write APIs, uh, understanding, the, understanding the protocols, how the data is transferred between each device, and how and, and know the, uh, the strategies, what, what kind of strategies can be used uh, in uh, de uh, deplo uh, deploying the software. Uh, so from like start to point, I think there are three, case, three keys that um, are the essential for any startup. So if you're working with uh, imaging, of course. So uh, the first one is data access. So we as a company started from uh, using open data uh, from available on the internet. Well, it uh, was not as, its quality was not as, as, as expected. So we uh, negotiated, negotiated the deals with hospitals to get uh, anonymized data from their uh, data warehouses. And of course, on top of that, you also have to uh, be aware of all the data security and data protection issues. So this is a very inter interesting topic as well. And then you need to have infrastructure, mainly for developing your uh, models. So uh, this requires multiple servers, uh, lots of GPUs. Uh, you want to have a secure network because, well, you're dealing with uh, private data. And this is uh, a full-time job, actually. And lastly, and but not, uh, not least, not least, but uh, you, you need to have know-how how to build models because, well, these skills are not very 
like a, a commodity. The, the people who actually know how to do things are very uh, rare to find, uh, especially in countries uh, like, uh, like ours where, well, let's say education is not at the top level compared to, let's say, U.S. universities. Uh, so you just have to have uh, one or two or even more uh, data scientists with some machine learning background who has some experience with computer vision techniques and ideally uh, comfortable working with building APIs. So how does the world pipeline look like when you want to build something and uh, make it to production? So from the data perspective, you have like uh, people working with training code, uh, people working with label, uh, data labeling, then uh, like uh, model building, uh, web building web applications, and make it, making it, uh, making it into the like the pipeline of things that drive uh, the let's say improvement of your software. So typically, this kind of pipeline is split into three, let's say, distinct categories of, of professions. So uh, in one, uh, at first stage, you have data engineers. So these, these people are responsible for know-how of the data. So what kind of data we have, the, the, let's say, uh, some kind of mistakes in the data and, and, and such. And they transfer this data uh, information to data scientists who are like, responsible for building the, the core piece of all the uh, software. And on top layer you have like, a, uh, uh, like developers working with that kind of, uh, uh, with working with these, these models to productionize it, to, to make it uh, usable for the end client. Um, yeah, so, in, all this has to like commun all these teams have to communicate between each, each other. So uh, each part is uh, important and responsible for doing this kind of specific task. And when you have split responsibilities between team members, it is uh, much easier to streamline the process, like, uh, update your software, uh, make upgrades, and and, and so so. Uh, it is, uh, it, is, it is good to have a diverse team uh, at the start. And uh, well, I, was, I'm to I, was to I talked a lot about uh, the modeling part, but when you look at the bigger picture, the modeling part is actually a very, 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 very small piece of all the things you have to do. It's like a cherry on a cake. And well, this, there is this concept that AI and machine learning is this, this little piece of uh, red square where the training code exists and the models are built, and they call uh, and we call that artificial intelligence. But when you look deeply and try to understand that, you need lots of human labor to, for that artificial intelligence actually work. So you can have a very good model, very good data, but if you're not don't know how, how to like. <laughs> release it to the public or to deploy it to the, to the clients, it's, it's, uh, it becomes useless. Um, so I will talk about uh, this cherry on top. Uh, I'm not going a lot, this is not going to be technical. I, I would, I, 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 as I understand the audience is kind of, well, distributed like uh, in the way that there are more newcomers to the field who are interested to know the things and, and such. But this is going to be interesting for uh, uh, all of you. Um, so what we do at Occiput is uh, try to uh, understand the process of, uh, radiolo uh, of how radiologists works. So we have two data sources uh, when it comes to chest x-ray, so it's images and reports, and uh, to understand the image, we have to understand the report. So uh, there is lots of work involved in understanding that, uh, the text, actually, which is uh, free text, not standardized. Uh, it is very, so there is different styles of reporting. Sometimes the same sentence can mean different thing in a different context. So all that has to be uh, accounted for. And what we have built is a text mining, uh, let's say, a system, which ha uh, is able to crunch the report and spit out standardized 
things about this uh, report and image. So currently we cover uh, over 70 different, uh, let's say, findings, and uh, we have uh, over a million reports uh, processed uh, to date. So, yeah, so we have this software, we have uh, an image uh, with labels assigned to the image, and we built a model. So typically what you, uh, you do, you have a collection of images, uh, collection of standardized uh, uh, labels, uh, which I talked about uh, earlier. Uh, then you choose, a, let's say, neural network uh, architecture, or uh, typically between common uh, available architectures, and try to uh, train the model and uh, deploy it to production. So the end result uh, is, is the following, that you have a software which only takes the image as input. Uh, the software predicts the probabilities of, probabilities of some specific findings. Let's say in this image we have enlarged heart with a high probability. Um, and the network itself also provides some basic uh, understanding uh, by which area of interest the neural network understood that this finding is relevant uh, in this image. Well, this approach uh, also, also looks very like, like straightforward, work on text mining, uh, define the problem, pick a neural net, uh, network architecture and such. But actually, if you want to beat the radiologist at his work, you have to label the data by yourself. So, it's not, well, having text is important, but also sometimes it is kind of relevant to know what, which kind of area the text is describing, right? So what we do at Occiput is we hire radiologists who look at the image, uh, at the report, and they actually do the manual uh, thing of like annotating the area of interest of uh, the specific uh, findings. Uh, so this kind of data allows us to build models which are stronger uh, uh, than previous ones, which have better performance and, uh, well, we can trust them more, actually, and visualize better. Um, so having all that in mind, uh, we have three types of uh, data in our, let's say, company. So first one is text and images. The second one is uh, images with boxes, so some tasks require a simple uh, task like putting a bounding box around the area of interest. And the third uh, part is segmentation where you just define the area pixel by pixel with, uh, with exact uh, coordinates. And when you have this kind of data, you can build three types of models. So it's classification, detection, segmentation. Each model responsible for a different task. Uh, then you combine this, these models into one big model zoo, let's say, and uh, you can uh, then actually have this kind of output, uh, do the interpretation of the output you have, and transform that uh, predict these predictions into the, the report I have shown you at the beginning of the uh, presentation. Yeah, so this is, in a nutshell, it's, it's the basic idea what we do at Oxpit and how our software works. There are lots of hidden details behind it and it's actually, there's actually a lot of, lot of difficult problems we try to solve. Uh, first of all is cleaning your data. So if you're a data scientist, you already know that well, cleaning, cleaning data is like the, the first step you have to do in order to uh, boost your model uh, metrics or, 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 or under, understand the problem you're working on. So the first thing that we try to do is, well, we were dealing with this kind of artifacts in a chest x-ray. So there are many different manufacturers of x-ray devices and each uh, device generates a specific artifact on the image. 
uh, on top of that, the doctor who does the x-ray uh, in the procedure room can also put some, some artifacts on the image. And well, it is actually a problem, uh, kind of a big problem for us. I'll explain to you later, but the, the idea is that we want to kind of hide th these artifacts from our models uh, that they would not overfit on, let's say, uh, the small squares on the left or letters R or m probably some personal information. Uh, so what we did, uh, we spent some time manually annotating the artifacts. So I think it's in the area of 2,000 images, not, not, too, not, too much, too, not too many, so uh, the task itself is pretty straightforward. Anyone can do it. And we built a model which would predict these kind of boxes on the new images, so unseen images, and do the masking part on the image. The problem, what we saw was that, okay, we were at that time dealing with three devices, so uh, three X-ray devices, uh, and so as I mentioned earlier, each X-ray device has its own artifacts, and this is a representation of the average predicted box on the, uh, uh, on the chest X-ray. So if you could see, there are uh, some common places where artifacts are, uh, artifacts are placed. Uh, so having all this in mind, we, we, what we actually were trying to, to solve or to answer questions to was, is it possible to train a neural network, a model, which would be able, would not be able to, pre to predict which device the image came from? So let's say you have an X-ray from a Philips device. Uh, what is the chance that if you gave a similar uh, X-ray from the, uh, the from the same Philips device? What is the chance that it will know that this X-ray came from the, that device uh, beforehand? And the results were kind of interesting. So, so the first iteration was, oh, let's build a model without masking any artifacts and train the model. So uh, I started training a model, and the <laughs> first step of the results was like all the metrics were close to 100%. So the model was able to overfit on these artifacts I ta uh, talked earlier. Um, so the following step was, okay, uh, we identified the problem, we know how to solve it, let's put masks, uh, black boxes on these artifacts and train, retrain the model. Uh, it turned out uh, to be a failure, failure because, well, the neural network actually overfitted on the black box positions on the, the, on the image and uh, uh, so the neural network understood the, the device indirectly, not, not knowing that artifacts actually were masked. And actually took three epochs to reach the 99% accuracy, but still it's kind of simple model and uh, trained quite fast. And at the last stage, like a, a last resort, we tried to, okay, we have three devices like, uh, like here, what if we put all the uh, boxes of each device on each every device? So let's say we have four, uh, four artifacts here. So for each image in the data set, we put four uh, black boxes on the original image. So in that sense, we would not overfit on the position of, on the black box, but uh, in, well, in, hopes, uh, in hope of like, <laughs> solving this issue. But this also turned out to be a failure. So the model also, also took 15 epochs to train, let's say 15 times more time of computation, computation power. But it still learned that also without artifacts, it is still kind of an easy task for a black box machine to, de to decide which device the photo came from, which was kind of surprising for me. And I tried to dig up in a 
let's say, Kaggle competitions, which I have not followed for, 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 for some time. And actually, there was a similar competition in, in Kaggle where the same, prob the same problem was in, like, in, in global domain. So uh, there were many photos from Flickr, uh, on Twitter, and, and such. So, and each like, say, photo had its uh, device and metadata. And the task was to predict the metadata from the image without metadata. And it turned out also to be a trivial task, some, somewhat trivial task for uh, neural networks. So this, uh, this was surprising for me uh, at that time. Yeah, so, mm, okay, the following step that also, well, Processing is also important for neural networks, so you want to have, uh, when you train a model, you want your images to be standardized, so the, to remove the, let's say, variation between images uh, artificially beforehand, before training the neural network. So what typically people do is like try to uh, the, uh, scale the, the images so that, let's say, standard, the standard deviation would be close to, let's say, one, or the mean pixel value would be close to uh, zero or, or so. There are lots of techniques to do that, but, um, and we thought, okay, we have a neural network, we have, uh, we have our preprocessing pipeline, but still, when we look at the images, so actually these six photos come from six different devices. So when, when you look at those images closely, you still can see that there is some differences between each image. So one is more white, uh, other is more black, uh, uh, more black. One images have uh, uh, ribs better represented in the image, uh, others uh, less. So we tried to somewhat rethink our, pros uh, our thinking about what preprocessing we can do so that even us uh, could say that each image from each different device s looks similar to us and hopefully for neural network. Uh, so there is this very, well, for, maybe forgotten technique like uh, histogram normalization. So what it uh, tries to do, to do so uh, if, you, if you know that the image pixel distribution is between 0 and 255 uh, in the 8-bit scale, uh, so what if we try to re uh, redistribute pixel values in that way that the cumulative distribution of pixels would be linear? So in that sense that each, let's say, uh, normalized pixel value would have, a, let's say, uniform-like uh, distribution. So in that sense that there would be equal number of white pixels and black pixels in the image. And this is a very popular technique like, like whitening the very black images in, in, uh, in the normal photos. And we applied that to our, uh, our images. Uh, well, for a normal person, these, the, these are kind of similar looking x-rays. But for ideologists, the image on the right is very, let's say, unusual. Uh, uh, it, it is a bit confusing for a doctor. But this is not, this is not a, a task what we're trying to solve. We're not trying to, like, let's say, make an image uh, visually appealing for a doctor. We want to make an image appealing to a neural network. Uh, so this is what we've done. Uh, and so the, uh, maybe I should have started with this. The problem we were facing was at first was we had a model with our usual preprocessing pipelines and we wanted to validate our model on different data sets with some specific parameterization, let's say 97% specificity. And we saw a very big variation of, of proposed uh, thresh, uh, probability threshold. And this was not uh, acceptable to us at, at that moment because, well, what, what value would I pick from, let's say, 0 0.12 or 0 0.25 or something in between? The range is kind of high, and it's actually hard to make a decision. 
But after this kind of normalization, retraining our, retraining our models and such, the variation of the proposed threshold on different validation sets is somewhat close uh, and it's much easier to make a decision what the operating uh, point of the model should be. Um, yeah, so we did that, but uh, at, we also noticed another interesting thing that well, some x-rays are done in a different way, so in a different way. So sometimes the, the lungs are pretty close, sometimes they are pretty far, and when the lung, lungs are pretty far, you can actually see the black uh, pixels uh, below your armpits, and when, uh, well, I talked about histogram norm normalization, so this actually brings a lot of skewness to the, to the normalization the histogram normalization output, so uh, it would be like a third from the right. And when you look at the, at the histogram normalization of these uh, two images, they are still look, they're still not uh, the same. They do not look the same. So we thought, okay, let's do the, the idea, let's me, uh, use the idea of like doing a center cropping of our images and fit the cumulative distribution function on the center crop and then reapply it to the original image. So these images are on the, on the right. And for me, personally, they seem to be more similar uh, uh, with the way the, the organs are represented in the image. Yeah, so this is kind of an uh, interesting task to do. Uh, so reprocessing is very relevant for, for our mm, problems we solve. Um, but all that comes to uh, the hardest problem of them all, it's validation. Uh, so just to bring some statistics what we have, we have uh, 10 radiologists working on annotating the images and we kind of uh, have the information how they agree on some of the findings. So let's say there's a finding pleural effusion and the agreement metric uh, between radiologists varies between 0.6 to 0.8. So in that sense it's like kind of a correlation coefficient. So if you, do, if you look at the pneumonia, it's like a common disease in, in winter. So there's only let's say 60% chance that uh, two different radiologists would come up to the same conclusion that you have pneumonia. And this actually changes your treatment. Uh, and it's not, it's not good. So having that in mind, we, we have data, we have reports, we have uh, manual annotations. But if you provide the same data to a different radiologist, you're going to receive a different uh, labeling outcome. So what to do next, What's, what, what, I'm, what am I going to do with, with that kind of information? And uh, to be honest, we do not have an answer to that yet. Well, it's still in, let's say, research phase. What, what, what is the golden standard for, um, for our models? So what do we have to, let's say, hire 10 people to look over, let's say, 10,000 images, do the uh, let's say majority vote uh, approximation of the, the, the this golden golden standard, uh, and it is uh, well at first it's 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 expensive. So radiologists are very uh, very well paid uh, profession, and on the other hand, majority vote can also be not necessarily a right approach because depending on the experience of a. Uh, a human annotator, so let's say you have three annotators, so let's say two of them are uh, freshman radiologists with, let's say, a, a year of experience, and you have a third radiologist with 10 years of experience. And you give, a, you give, it, uh, give an image to each of them, and two junior radiologists uh, agrees on, let's say, cancer, but the third one with uh, years of experience disagrees with them. So if you took the let's say, majority of the world approach, you would say that these two junior radiologists are probably right. But maybe the experience of the third radiologist is actually uh, uh, outweighs the, the opinion of two junior radiologists. 
And this is actually a, an interesting topic to discuss. And if anyone would have any ideas on that, I would be happy to chat, uh, to have a chat. Uh, on top of that, we have two different types of data, as I mentioned earlier. One is images with text, and other is just an image with a, uh, annotations of our radiologists. And when you measure the performance of, of the model you have at hand and use this kind of, this kind of information as your, let's say, ground truth, you have different uh, performance metrics, and it, it is very hard to explain uh, why, well, the, probably the most obvious one is that when the radiologist works at the hospital, he has all the information available about the patient, so he can ha make a better, uh, better informed decision about the patient. And when you only have images uh, and you ask this, to do the same task for a, a let's say, person not working in a hospital, but let's say at home, with no clinical data, he perceives the patient in a, in a different way. And so when we have, let's say, metrics of, let's say, 87 and 80%, I, st I cannot say if the model performs well or, 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 uh, or what to do with this, uh, these kind of numbers. So this is a big uh, issue as well. What, what is the metric we are trying to follow? What is the metric we are trying to maximize? What, what metric will satisfy the end user, let's say a hospital or radiologist? Uh, the other problem we face is valid, uh, validation on different data sets. So let's say you pick a specific problem, let's say cancer, uh, and you have a model built on say hundreds of thousands of images and you have a subsets of uh, data sets, uh, external data sets, which you try to validate your model on. And it is a, a very common situation that you cannot uh, actually say, or be certain which model is better because one model performs better on one validation set, the other on the other, third on the third. So which model is better, right? This is an issue. Um, another task, with also kind of uh, relevant to what I talked about earlier, is how radiologists perceive the image. So let's say we have a let's say cancer detection task, and uh, we know that the the patient has cancer. The radiologist does not know that, but we know that patient has cancer because. Well, it's clinically proven, and we want, uh, and we have these cancers graded by the difficulty. How easy it is to spot the cancer in the in the image. And again, uh, you have three different models uh, uh, performing differently on different difficulty setting, and you also cannot make a, like a definitive conclusion which model is better. Um, so to, to summarize, uh, I would say from the like, startup building uh, point of view, it's very important to have uh, clear goals at the beginning. So what you're trying to achieve, is this important? Do, do people uh, understand what you're trying to solve? Because it is very important as well. Uh, then validation. So as you can see, validation is very hard, especially in medical field. Uh, then having uh, metrics, it's, 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 it's when you ha don't have a validation you can trust, you can also not have a metrics you can trust. So these go hand in hand. So what metrics you're uh, trying to measure? Sometimes you want to measure the model performance, but sometimes you maybe want to just to measure the, let's say, outcomes of the patient and uh, deciding, deciding on what metrics you want to optimize can uh, shift the approach you are uh, taking in, in, in building your uh, models. Uh, then we have feedback loop. So it's like if you're working in a startup, it's like a, a number one thing you want to have to understand that the iterations you make, the product that you uh, upgrade, 
are actually uh, improving for a client as well. So does the client see the, the improvements of your software? Uh, is, the uh, is the client able to provide feedback for you? Do you, do you have a, let's say, a relationship with your clients? So this is very, so from a startup perspective, it's a very important part. Uh, from infrastructure perspective, deployment strategies and data protection are uh, also critical. So uh, imagine a situation where you have, let's say, 20 models trained for uh, many different tasks, and you want to deploy that uh, software in, let's say, a new client in different country, let's say in Turkey. Uh, the Turkey has its, its own data privacy laws, so are you able to deploy the software uh, so, as soon as, as possible, let's say in a few days? So having a pipeline for different kind of scenarios for, for the deployments is very, let's say, very useful because uh, when we started it was a, an issue for us because, well, it is very hard when you don't come from a, me uh, from a medical device, let's say, uh, uh, background, it is hard to understand how the things work at first. So we had to like, learn it the hard way, what, what kind of deployments the hospitals are expecting. So let's say that the first uh, idea, what we thought was, let's build cloud. Well, everybody does cloud, it's easy to sell, scale, and, and such, but when we, we, I look now retrospectively, it was a very naive thinking because, well, the hospitals have uh, personal data and they have little incentive of <laughs> uploading the data, the personal data to the cloud. Uh, so th this actually b brought us a, a whole new pipeline of like building anonymization software, implementing it into the deployments and such. So the, the typical deployment now is that we try to uh, ask for we, we ask for a virtual machine uh, to, which we can have full access to. We deploy our software, monitor it, uh, and so. And last but not least, certification. So you can have a, a very cool-looking medical device which solves uh, very hard problems in the, in the field. But if you're not able to certify, make it uh, legally uh, available for the clients, you actually cannot sell this product to any hospital in, in, in the world. So as a company, we understood this kind of er, uh, early, at the early stages, and we were able to get certification very, very early. Uh, and this is uh, it. Uh, so we as a team are expanding. So. If you're familiar of, uh, with any of these uh, logos or technologies and you would think that, okay, I would, could use the skills that I have, uh, please do contact us. We're, we're looking for people to help us build uh, and improve our software. Thanks. Okay. So thank you, Darius, for a very interesting and informative talk. And any question from the audience, Darius? Yeah. Um, hello. So first question I have is, uh, is quite general. It's about the field that you're working in, the medical AI. I wonder, um, in the lights of the quite recent events that uh, Google acquired medical companies that have access to all the medical data and stuff. Uh, how f how's the industry is changing and do you feel like uh, pressure or, or a race uh, to, to build the product? And yeah, so, well, in yeah, so. Yeah, so I understood that question. So, if I, if you look back, uh, let's say three or four years ago, IBM acquired, let's say, I think two billion X-rays, chest X-rays. So in three, four years, they have done nothing in that field. Uh, well, uh, I don't know about Google. Well, Google has published some papers in this field, but it does not mean that they, it is going to uh, going to, ho to the hospitals. Well, it is still not clear if they're going to pro pro make it into a product. 
we have several competitors in the field who do similar things, but still you can target different kind of audiences. So let's say we have a competitor in India who does uh, tuberculosis screening. So they're interested only interested in, in, in tuberculosis, which is a very common common disease in India, and uh, they provide uh, just a simple red flag, uh, does the patient has tuberculosis or not, let's say in, 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 in brief. Uh, what we tried uh, to achieve so far was to actually help the patient in the, in the, on the old cases, help the radiologist to make a better decisions in the, in the workstation he has. Um, on the other hand, there are so many medical problems to solve that uh, uh, I guess there are there's only a few strong startups in the in, in the medical AI which know which know what they are doing that the 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 things that you can work on in medical field is I think immeasurable. Uh, so yeah, chest X-rays are popular. Many people, many companies, and people try to do something here, but uh, it's. it's I would say that um, most of the comp uh, most of the competitors also uh, us as well struggle to actually build a working solution for medic uh, for a hospital. So, yeah. Thank you. And one more question, uh, just uh, it's more on the technical part. So, uh, your uh, we saw the, from the screenshots that you, you deal uh, at least uh, what 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 we have seen with the Lithuanian language. But I imagine you build uh, like a general solution, not depending from the language. Um, so, yeah. do you create models uh, like uh, for each language independently, or there is some some point in the pipeline that uh, merges into the single solution? Yeah. So there are two parts of it. So the first one is uh, text understanding. So we have uh, data sets from three countries, uh, Lithuania, Spain, and the United States. So for each of that data sets, we have uh, like text mining uh, algorithms or logic. Uh, and for the product is itself, it's uh, la language agnostic. So uh, we, it's kind of structurized uh, in the way that you are not dealing with a language, but dealing with uh, let's say tags of, of information. So let's say uh, enlarge the heart, uh, uh, plural effusion and such. There are kind of tags which can be translated to any uh, language independently what the original language was. So this is what we have done. Just a quick question. How receptive are hospitals and other organizations to your technology? Are they eager to try it or are they a bit skeptical of it? Uh, so there are, I think, two uh, types of hospitals uh, which uh, perceive artificial intelligence in a different way. Uh, so the first one uh, has expectations that artificial intelligence uh, should work uh, on all cases, uh, do no errors, uh, and, uh, and uh, well, be better than, than humans. And the other hospitals actually understand that uh, the models are imperfect, the, the data is imperfect, it's kind of hard to build a perfect uh, solution. So these kind of early adopters go, uh, actually are very eager to try it out and uh, we have a few who go, give us constant, uh, constant feedback and we're happy, uh, very happy with it. But in, in, in general, all, I would say that hospitals are aware of, aware of the uh, artificial intelligence coming to to the hospitals, but I think it's only the beginning of of medical AI. So uh, the first certified medical uh, AI solution certification was done two years ago. So it's very very early stages of medical AI, and I'm happy to be a part of it and being at the start of it. Uh, do you have a feedback loop? For, uh, I mean, when uh, your predictions do not match what in the end doctor decides? Uh, yes, and yes, then we Can do. you elaborate on that? Thanks. So, 
we have, uh, let's say, several deployments where we kind of, okay, we're providing the, the software for some minimal fee, but in, with, uh, with the idea that uh, we could get uh, reports, the final reports, uh, uh, to us automatically. So, so in, in, in the pipeline, we, uh, we receive an image, generate a report, send it to the hospital. Uh, the hospital, the radiologist sees, uh, looks at, uh, at our report, writes his own. Uh, it's stored in the hospital, and this final report also comes to our end. So we can actually compare the or, uh, our report to the or final report that the radiologist. Uh, uh, decided on and actually measure metrics how many reports were let's say not changed at all so we have this kind of feedback loop uh, I, I think both uh, first of all it's very nice to know metrics so <laughs> uh, the business metric actually uh, and it's also uh, interesting to know where the model fails. So, well, this, there was this kind of interesting situation uh, a, long, a long while ago. We built a cancer detection model uh, and deployed it into one of the uh, United Kingdom hospitals. They tested, uh, tested it for, let's say, a month or two, and they gave us the feedback, you're not detecting cancers, you're detecting nipples. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> It was not obvious for us, well, nipple, uh, sometimes nipples are visible on the x-ray and they're often uh, hard to, dis to d distinguish between the cancer and the nipple. So we put some effort into like hand labeling nipples and retraining them all. So this is kind of an example of feedback loop uh, in the research perspective. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Well, uh, how long has your startup existed, how long have you been working on this problem and how far are you from a market-ready product? So our company is over two years old, uh, two and a half, I think. So with the, for the first year, we were doing uh, consultancy work. So we just wanted to, uh, like, well, let's say, not burn uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, cash we had on our hands. So. We did some consulting. Uh, in the meantime, we built our pro first prototypes. So it's, it's, I think it's about two years now. Uh, we have sold it to a few clients. Uh, they are actually using that uh, software. So uh, I think the acceptance in the market started when we got the certification, which uh, happened, I think, uh, oh, let's say, I think a year ago. So yeah. You are talking about certification. Yes. You are currently certified by... Yeah, we, we have European certification, so we can sell it to European hospitals. But currently it's medical device directive, yes. Yeah, so we have a C class 2A or so. So we ha it's not like a, it's like a recommendation uh, system certification. So it's not to replace radiologists, but just like a secondary tool to have. Yeah, because this year on May is new medical device uh, regulation directive. Yeah. And it's yeah. more complex and it's more like FDA. Yeah, so we are working on that. We have, when you have a certification, you have to recertify yeah. every year. Yeah, uh, because and it's a <laughs> very big problem for all, a lot of companies. Yeah, so, so we actually have a de dedicated persons uh, just on certification. And how is the possibility to be certified? Because it's uh, quite a lot of steps do, uh, considering software and risks. Uh, I think it's kind of early to say. <laughs> well, I'm not personally involved in that, but okay. our last certification was a, couple, well, let's say a few months ago, so we still have like, like nine or, uh, or eight months to to figure things out for the next upcoming one. Like five. Yep. Like five months, because on yeah, May. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, okay, let, let's, let's five. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if we don't have any question, so thank you, Darius, and thank you all for coming today. Yeah. So.
I think we have one more. Are you planning to expand your tool for more areas like uh, this? No, I would say no at the moment because we, well, let's say we're trying to build a different product on the same data at uh, this stage, so uh, it's still too early to talk about that, but it comes to like automating part of, uh, fully automating part of radiologist workflow, yeah. So thank you all for coming today and see you next time. <laughs>